Hello and welcome to NewsClick. Today, we are joined by Professor Ajaz Ahmed and we will be discussing the situation in West Asia. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Uh, Professor Ahmed, since the last time we discussed the situation in Iran and West Asia as a whole, there have been a lot of uh, developments, some of which have been quite uh, scary to say the least. So there was the attacks on the tankers, then there were further sanctions imposed recently by the US and Iran and most importantly, the drone that was shot down and according to US media reports, we were just 10 minutes away from a strike by Donald Trump on certain facilities in Iran, radar and military facilities. So, do you see the stepping back of the United States from that strike as just a, a what do you call a momentary or, name, or, or a sudden gesture or is this likely to, or is it a more thought out uh, step in the sense that they understand that there is only so far they can go? So is this likely to be repeated again or what do you think about it? My sense is that it's very difficult to say. The story seems to me rather bogus and I'll come to that. Uh, uh, I think there is an institutional chaos on top of everything else in the US. The US at the moment does not have a defense secretary. Now you can't go to war without a defense secretary. <laughs> So the result is that Bolton is actually functioning not only as a national security advisor, but as a proxy president. So he's making decisions. Now, <clears throat> I think this whole story of they were all very ready to take off and strike and 10 minutes before and so on. This seems to be one of those stories that get cooked up to or something else. My say that it's quite possible that Bolton and Pompeo, Bolton in particular, in his capacity as the National Security Advisor, ordered all that. And then some very high officials of the Pentagon, quite possibly the General uh, Chiefs of Staff, uh, came up to Trump and said, this is disastrous. Uh, right. This will lead to a full scale war. Right. Uh, so that seems to me to be much more of a, a possibility than this little drama that, uh, that cooked up. Uh, so far as that is concerned, even that may be an exaggeration. It may not have gone nearly as far as they are saying it went. But this is certainly true that there are officials like Bolton and Pompeo, a very large section of the uh, US Senate and Congress, which work very closely with, uh, with, this, with Israel and so on, who want that fight. Whereas military experts all over the world are saying, this is just not on because this uh, we know we don't know what repercussions will be. Having said that, I think basically Iran has won this round. First, they have made quite clear from the beginning that this is a this is a defense that is going to be you know, going to be played out in the American part of the court, you know. Um, uh, so, and then they went on and, and shot the, the drone, by which they also showed their technical capacity to shoot down America's primary, primary drone, uh, which was not even supposed to have been in that region, in fact, uh, it may be, uh, you know, how it even arrived there is very unclear. And they shoot this down, flying at 60,000 feet or some such thing, with a weapon that is probably made in, manufactured by the, uh, by the Iranians themselves. It is not a Soviet weapon, I mean, Russian weapon. So there is that. And so on the one hand, a, a technical 
uh, display that we can do this. And if we can do this, then many other things follow. Uh, but also saying that if you're going to, to give us military threats, it, though that confrontation will take place on our terms. Because they sit on top of the Gulf. So I think they have won this round. But we are at a very dangerous moment, you know, in, in everything. Uh, and I actually blame the, uh, the Europeans for all of this. That's a different story. That's a different story. So we'll come to that. But before that, <clears throat> also to slightly step back. And just to wanted to know what exactly the US strategy here is. Because on the one hand, this is not Iraq, which has been weakened by a decade of sanctions. And this is not even Venezuela, where the US has propped up a coup leader, a domestic leader. So you have Iran, which is which also has allies in the region, has one of the most powerful militaries in the region too. And the US has committed forces, both naval and land forces, to the extent that there is almost no turning back without a substantial loss of face as far as the US is concerned. So if even for Bolton and the sections allied in the Congress and Senate, what exactly is the possibility they might be aiming for? Uh, I, I think there is a, there is a little, real policy chaos. Uh, you mentioned uh, Venezuela. Now, what happened? With great fanfare, they recognized this new government. Right. And Europeans, idiotic, just followed in the U.S. footsteps and recognized that fake government. And it collapsed like a house of cards. It's ridiculous the, the way in which it collapsed. Likewise, what happened in North Korea? There was a lot of saber rattling, you know, our armada is on the way, etc. Uh, this, that, and the other. And the next thing you know, uh, he has made a peace initiative. Nothing came out of that peace initiative either. Um, and but he has made a fool of himself. Now he goes there and he crosses the, uh, the you know, uh, demilitarized that line and so on, etc. But theater it has absolutely no substance whatsoever. So two major, these were the three great um, wars he was going to fought or whatever, uh, uh, three aggressions of various kinds. Venezuela, North Korea, they've already become absurd. And my sense is that that is where it's going in Iran so far as the policy vacuum in the U.S. is actually concerned. The problem is that there you have, you are dealing with Israel and Saudi Arabia, who are extremely irresponsible powers. Trump seems to be very, very beholden to the Israeli lobby in a way that previous presidents were not. And there's, of course, Kushner, uh, who is virtually an Israeli, and so on. Uh, so that is where I think the danger is with the kind of allies that they have. And the, the extent to which they have gone forward. Um, and they think that they, that they could somehow just carry this on. And what the, um, the, what the Iranians are saying is that, no, there's going to be a settlement fast. We are not going to allow our economy to collapse the way it's uh, erupted. Right. So you, sanctions, huh. you know. Right. Yeah, so you mentioned the Iranians not willing to let their economy collapse. And one of the angles they have pursued in this is engagement with the Europeans and the other signatories uh, in a larger sense. So recently on the 28th, I think the, there was a conference in Vienna where the European of officials inaugurated Instex officially. But even now, there doesn't seem to be too much momentum in that. And even Iran has indicated that it is, it's a positive step, but not really enough. So... Is there any possibility that this direction might actually help them salvage their economy to a bit? You know, Instex is um, 
covers only trade which is allowed by U.S. sanctions, which is the which is food and medicine. They are not. The Europeans have explicitly said that they are not going to use it to break the U.S. sanctions. So then, what are we dealing with? Um, it, it is it, at the moment it's financed at one billion, which is not terribly much. So this is an empty gesture that they, that, that they have made. Uh, they are not. They are not. They will. They will use this to carry on the trade, which is already exempted from the sanctions. So why bother? You know. So that is why uh, they actually gave them. 7th of July is the deadline when they either have to deliver or uh, get out of the game. The NI view was actually a failure, even though the Europeans tried to present it as a great step forward that they had taken. Um, the Iranians are very suave diplomats. They're probably the world's most sophisticated diplomats at the moment. Um, they sort of said, yes, thank you very much. It's a sort of a nice, positive thing. But uh, they continued with saying July 7th is the deadline by which you have to come through. But we have already increased our stockpile. We are enriching it, etc., all within the parameters of the actually the letter of the deal. So they are not in violation of the deal, although that is what the Americans are saying, and that's what the Europeans will say. You know, so the betrayal is actually from the Europeans, in my view. And would China, for instance, be able to, uh, would you think there's a possibility of, say, China stepping in and continuing, or they've already continued to accept Iranian oil? So does that offer some sort of a lifeline as far as the economy is concerned, or...? Would they also at some point have to withdraw? My sense is that the Chinese will be extremely careful and they will devise some other uh, mechanism because, I mean, that is what is very important to watch. Uh, you see, there can be a direct line to Turkey through that. Um, they can also be a lot of trade with Russia. Russia will actually probably take a much more openly aggressive stance on carrying on trade, uh, etc. Um, my sense is that in openly, that's where it will come from. The Chinese will do what they can. Uh, they are setting up, so far as I know, some mechanisms with their banks, some of their biggest banks, uh, to, to be able to trade with Iran, not in the name of the government, but through its bank, uh, and almost daring the Americans to sanction the bank. Uh, you know, because that, that, that gets into another kind of game. But they be, I think, taking very cautious steps. I don't expect them to do anything very dramatic. Russians are the ones that I expect to do things dramatic, including if the war, uh, uh, you know, begins, if the uh, military confrontation goes forward, uh, I won't be surprised if the Russians uh, supply weapons. Okay, right. And uh, in this context, India's position is also interesting because uh, recently, especially with the G20 summit, Pompeo's visit, there was a perception that the Indian government is actually not maybe standing up to the United States, but at least raising its point. And the G20 summit, the RIC meeting also between Xi and Putin and Modi was also quite prominent. But is there any possibility that India might on the issue of Iran take a much stronger stand because until now it's been quite weak. It's just completely banned all imports as well. If Germany wants, if France wants, you expect India to do <laughs> Right. <laughs> yeah, no brain in trying for the United States. Right. Uh, you know, uh, this is, 
even if you can make polite noises. The, and the, the, that's what the Iranians are saying, that we have had a year of polite noises. Uh, now we are going to go, go forward according to our own judgment. And uh, if you, your behavior changes, we'll step back. Um, I don't expect Indians to do anything of the sort. Um, they never have, they never will. So there's also, of course, the largest state of the U.S. alliance in the region, the U.S., Israel, Saudi Arabia axis and the countries around it. And one of the key moments in recent times regarding that was the Manama conference, although ostensibly it was about the so-called deal of the century. But it is also an attempt at building a larger consensus of countries on all these issues. So do you think that in the uh, event of, say, an armed conflict, that this alliance of larger countries in West Asia, the larger alliance of countries in West Asia will actually hold or will there be further divisions between them? Um, I, I think these are two different dynamics, uh, actually. Um, the real thing that is going on in Palestine is Israel's decision to actually annex uh, uh, large parts of the West Bank. That dynamic got uh, scuttled uh, by the election results and then the fall of the government, Netanyahu's government, and the prospects that now are of great chaos, political chaos in Israel. So, um, so I, I think that is what uh, the real dynamic is. Uh, there is no power in the world to, to prevent them. They have decided that the Trump administration is the great chance that they have to fully implement right. their uh, total um, plan, and they are not going to wait to see if uh, Trump is going to get re-elected. Right. So that, 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 that is the real dynamic which has been scuttled for a while. Uh, because of this political chaos in Israel. Uh, the so-called peace plan is to offer a certain amount of money um, to make this palatable to a certain very large class of Palestinian uh, businessmen and so on who want, you know, who, who, who have been in cooperation with uh, with uh, Israel for a very long time and so on, in, in very many of the, uh, you know, uh, Palestinian Authority officials and so on. Uh, so that, 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 that's what the game is. But I think what the great success of the Manama Conference is that the main... Uh, Gulf powers, and not all of them, mind you. Uh, UAE and uh, Saudi Arabia in particular uh, have now come out as being Israeli allies, as being people who are responsive to this. Again, rhetorically, Saudi Arabia says, but in order to do all this, you have to get a peace plan and so on and so forth. But uh, the, 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 those are gestures. The fact of the matter is that this was a big public relations exercise in which the, this alliance between Israel and the uh, UAE and Saudi Arabia um, is getting cemented step by step, step by step. I, I think that that's the reason. Uh, but what also became very clear is that even the majority of the Arab states don't find it uh, possible to really uh, go as far as that. And um, then there are powerful countries, you know, uh, like Iraq or, uh, you know, major countries, Iraq, Kuwait, Oman, Qatar. Uh, who are opposed to us. So in that sense, it was a, a, a 
It was a PR uh, exercise rather than anything substantive. Um, the last thing I would say about it is that, you know, um, Rex Tillerson, who was uh, the previous Secretary of State in in has recently given uh, an interview to Washington Post, in which he talks about how uh, Kushner was going behind his back all the time with Mexico and this. Here again, what you have is a remarkable absence of diplomats. It is Kushner, my piece. So it's, it's a very strange kind of PR being done for Israel by the Trump family, these highly corrupt people. Right. Thank you so much, Professor Edmund.